Hello everyone, Derek Barefoot back with you on the Typologetics YouTube channel with my wife May to be reading again for us and our continuing study, Science, History, and Scripture. We're in Genesis 3. We're talking about Eve, the mother of all living. Let's open with prayer. Father, give us wise and obedient hearts as we grow in the knowledge of you through your Son. Amen. Mm. All right. So I was observing last time that when we go to Genesis 3, very oddly, I think, um, Adam names his wife Eve for the word for life or living in verse uh, 20, right after he gets the news that, that they will be dying. <laughs> now, you know, uh, you might say there's a slight bit of news about, you know, the woman's the seed will strike the serpent in the head. And I said, this seems to be talking at the surface level about the, the difficult relationship humans have with snakes, particularly in uh, South Asia, which includes the Middle East and uh, Africa, and particularly in times that were even more uh, wild in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, the landscape. Uh, and also, I should note in that respect that when you look over into verse 15, the order of the, the sort of battle between the woman's seed or children and the serpent, he shall bruise you on the head. Like I said, humans, when they uh, have to kill a snake, they go for the head. And you, that is the serpent, shall bruise him on the heel. Uh, that's kind of an odd order. We apply it, I think, rightly, uh, uh, symbolically, to uh, Christ and Satan, the crucifixion. But it does have, uh, you know, you'd think that the bruising on the head would come after the bruising on the heel, but it doesn't. So anyway, there is a little note there that definitely has a symbolic application, but we're reading right now at uh, sort of uh, uh, the level below that. And so it's it's doubly strange that Adam thinks of calling his wife living because she will be the because she was the mother of all living before she's become a mother. Now, if it was the case that Adam was uh, let's say to stretch a point that he was saying that Eve would be you know, he was saying this prospectively uh, even though that's not actually the tense in Hebrew, from what I can determine, uh, say we take it, he was saying uh, that Eve would become the mother, you know, because, you know, she would become the mother of all human children going forward. Well, the logical place to put this, I, I pointed out it would be logical to put it after she gave birth to Cain and Abel because, you know, until they grow up to adults, they're the only children, the only other people that are mentioned there until they reach adulthood. At least the, the others, assuming they aren't mentioned, don't, don't enter into the narrative uh, of the first part of chapter four. But if you were going to put it earlier than that, look back again at chapter one when God made man, as the account in chapter uh, 1 reads, in verse 28, May, just review that for us, verse 28. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and roll over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the, on the earth. Okay, so... Here in chapter one, you know, God made man. He created them male and female as with the rest of creation in chapter one. It's from a view high above. It's like a 35,000 foot viewpoint, you know, in chapter one. Very different from what we get in uh, chapters uh, two and three. Um, but after creating them male and female, and you notice how kind of generic and distant that is. It's not a very personal picture of creation that we got in verse 27. It just says, just as male and female, uh, you, you don't form uh, much of a picture. Of course, you know what male and female humans are, but not like with Adam and Eve that you form this mental picture of their character as the story unfolds. But then he tells them to have children, right? Mm -hmm. Be fruitful. Uh, multiply. So he's saying, have a lot of children and grandchildren. So 
if we were to sort of, you might ask the question, when did God tell them this in the account of chapter 2? Remember, chapter 2 starts over, and then God makes man from the dust of the ground. We've been through this. It's not as if chapter 2 doesn't repeat anything. It repeats several things from chapter 1, uh, forming of the animals. It does so in different terms. But it's not as if it's not trying to repeat anything. But there is no command. In fact, God does not, in chapters 2 and 3, God does not speak to both the man and the woman until he calls them to account for their sin. See, in other words, he gives a command to Adam in, in 2.16, um, and presumably then Eve learned about the command because Adam had been told the command, that you might think, well, if God told them to have children, where would you put that in if you were going to insert it into the story of Genesis chapters 2 or 2 and 3? Well, you couldn't put it, you wouldn't put it um, after they disobey because it said God blessed them and said to them, have in subjection. That just doesn't go with God calling them to account for their sin, as we have seen. So you'd have to put it before that point. So presumably at some point that's unmentioned here, God says to the two of them, have many children. Well, that would be a, norm, a natural time if Adam was going to say to his wife, you know, you will be the mother of, of all living. It would be after God has just told them to have many children. See what I mean? So in other words, there are a couple of natural points or sort of natural points when you might have Adam naming his wife Eve, but the place where it is is not uh, one of those natural places, but it calls attention to itself, I think, because of its more prophetic dimension, that higher symbolic level. Because this is, you know, the this is the man and woman that are founding this human family. And that, of course, is going to be a picture of Jesus Christ and his bride. We've already seen that, which is the church, right? So we have to start thinking then when it talks about the mother of the living, well, would that apply to Jesus Christ's bride, the church? In, in what way, or is it would appropriate to say that the church is the mother of all the living? Well, I think that you can right away see that there's some truth in that to the extent that through Jesus Christ as the new father of the human race. Of course, it's in a different way than Adam was, but nevertheless, Paul makes that connection that Christ being the life giver, but his bride is involved with uh, many people being given life. And the involvement is in this way. Throughout the Old Testament, cities or nations, and nations were often uh, city-states, they are often spoken of in terms of the, the city and the nation, you know, that the city is a capital of, say, like Babylon uh, or Nineveh or Jerusalem, is spoken of as a woman and then the population as being her children. Now, we won't look at, at all the instances of that, but let's look at where it's carried over at a place where we've been before. So let's go into the New Testament to the book of Galatians again. And um, once again, we'll go to Galatians 4, but this time with an eye toward the way that Paul uses this idea of uh, children. So Galatians chapter 4, and Paul, of course, in 4, he's speaking really about the, the acceptance of Gentile converts into the Christian church, into the Christian faith, and how that was done outside of law and custom and fleshly effort 
And he makes that comparison very much like the births of Ishmael and Isaac differed in that way, Ishmael being born according to law and custom and fleshly effort, but Isaac being born through promise and spirit. And he, he saw an analogy there to uh, the, uh, the Gentile believers who were coming in. But as he's speaking of it, if you'd read for us verses 24 through 26. Of four. Of four. This is allegorically. <laughs> <laughs> allegorically. <laughs> allegorically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, speaking for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. All right. So do you catch that in verse 24, where it says that he's talking about covenants. Of course, covenants uh, produce groups of people. Uh, they, they, as it were, sort people. And that's what happened with Israel. By being in a covenant, they were sorted out from the nations. They were brought together under that covenant. So he says, these, these two women, that is Hagar and, and Sarah, are, are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. So he saw this, of course, Hagar, uh, you know, taken as a secondary wife through custom and law and then fleshly effort to produce children. He saw that as being the way, the situation that Israel was in, in their attempt to pursue the grace of God through the just ever more punctilious uh, uh, keeping of the, the law covenant, hoping to, to get there that way. But it's the, this bearing of children. And what it really means is that there's a group and the children are the members of the group and you're shifting perspectives between the group in its corporate identity and the group as being composed of individuals. Uh, it says in verse 25, as May read, that the present Jerusalem is in slavery with her children. Mm. So the system, the religious system at Jerusalem was in slavery to the extent that they had not uh, accepted the liberation from the tutorship of the law as you know they had observed it according to custom uh, and through Christ they had not accepted that freedom as of yet and so he says uh, she is in slavery with her children that is the system the uh, the group as a whole was in that that kind of bondage um, and then individuals on an individual level the many individuals uh, were participants in that uh, that bound uh, spiritual situation, if it were, if you can think of it that way. And then it gets to what we've read before, the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. So who's the hour here, right? The hour is believers, meaning when he says our mother, mm -hmm. she's talking about the mother of believers. Mm -hmm. And Notice something else here that you might not have before. In verse 25, it, it says in, uh, in the NASB that we're reading from that, that uh, this Hagar corresponds to the what? What is uh, this? Jerusalem. Yeah, what's the word before Jerusalem? Uh, correspond to present. Present the present Jerusalem. Now, you're, you're reading the King James, it says, I think, the Jerusalem that is now. But that is in the present time. That is the historical Jerusalem uh, uh, during Paul's day right then. But then when he says the Jerusalem above, it's a contrast. Uh, the Jerusalem above is not the the present day Jerusalem. It's not the Jerusalem of now. Well, how does that work? It's because the Jerusalem above 
is the perfected people of God in the way that God envisions them. Um, kind of like Jesus said that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are living to God because of the perspect, uh, perspective resurrection. He says, so they're all living to him. You know, that's, that's uh, in, in Luke. Uh, and so that the ideal of God's perfected people in his purpose, in his plan, is that Jerusalem above. And so just, uh, we shouldn't need to, to drive this point home too, too hard, but if we would just look, for example, over at uh, 1 John, since we're close by, chapter five, So, 1 John 5, and, and let, uh, read uh, verse 12. Uh, let's go ahead and read 12 and 13, please. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay, so the life theme is common in John. We could go to several other scriptures. But he who has the Son has the life. So he who has the Son is the living. So the, the children of the Jerusalem above, uh, of this people in the plan and purpose of God, are the living ones. <laughs> you know, so this is the woman. Now, it doesn't say, like it says the Jerusalem above, it doesn't say the Eve. No. Okay. But this Eve, which is drawn from that word for living, it's kind of like, Jesus being called Emmanuel. Well, no one ever actually calls him Emmanuel. You know, it's a prophetic name. Um, and it, it occurs when Matthew is applying that prophecy, meaning God is with us. Well, this Eve, I think, is also life of the woman is a prophetic name. The believers are the children of the living one in that they're members of the body of those who are living. And of course, that kind of language goes back to uh, Jesus himself. It's in uh, the book of John about uh, that, you know, uh, well, let's turn back there briefly. Let's just verify a couple of places um, so that it's firmly in our minds. John chapter 5. John chapter 5 and uh, verse 25. Mm -hmm. So, um, just 25? Uh, you can read uh, uh, 25 and 26. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so, he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Okay. He, Jesus is talking both about the future resurrection to actual immortality and a renewal of life in the spirit mm -hmm. that brings a person alive in the spiritual sense because he says an hour is coming. Okay, that's the hour of the future resurrection. So that's coming. And now is. So in other words, there's a life that's coming and there's a life being given right now. Those who hear will live just as people will hear his voice and come to life at the general resurrection of the dead. People hear the voice of the Son of Man, those who truly hear, then come to have that life in themselves in having that, that being that new creation, having that uh, a new perspective. Maybe do one more. It's uh, familiar to us, I think, but Ephesians. So right after Galatians. So Ephesians uh, chapter 2, mm -hmm. verses 4 through 6. Four to six. Okay. Yeah, four through six. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love we, with which he loves us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. 
and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, so there it is. We were dead. We were made alive. And that kind of language goes back into the, uh, the synoptic gospels too. So if you think of, uh, we won't uh, look at it right now, but the place where the man said, I'll follow you uh, to Jesus, but permit me to bury my father. And then Jesus said, uh, let the dead bury their dead, meaning let those who are spiritually dead uh, take care of the uh, death arrangements of those who are spiritually de de dead. Um, and in that case, the man was probably talking about uh, of a father who w had not actually yet died, was just old, and he, he, he wanted to stay with him until he died and buried him, <laughs> you know, and then, and then come follow Jesus. Um, but clearly, Jesus was using that, the, the term of dead, referring to a spiritual situation. So we can even find that uh, outside uh, the uh, Gospel of John or, you know, in the, the synoptics, we find that same idea. So I think this odd place where Adam names his wife is where we see the symbolic prophetic of reality uh, that was hidden in that account peeking through, sort of um, at like a, the, the Holy Spirit kind of hung a, a, a little bit of a, a sign on it or, you know, a, a flashing light um, to draw our attention to it and it uh, reminds us that we've already seen that that symbolism of Christ and the church is genuine when we read it earlier. Okay, so having covered that, we have time to get started a little bit on a couple more ideas, going back to Genesis 3, where it says that, uh, verse 22, let's go to there and read that again. So right after Adam, sort of names his wife uh, kind of out of the blue, uh, but in a, with a very deep prophetic meaning. Then we get this. Okay, 22. 22. Then the Lord said, God, oh, the, the then Lord. the Lord God said, Behold, the, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Okay. And as I said... Um, this is, comes, uh, it reads oddly, given how much God has said, starting in verse, uh, especially in verse um, uh, 14, you know, that the, the prophetic uh, a sentence on the woman, and then 17 through 19, uh, you know, it was... God had already recognized the sin and then spoken at some length about it, and then he seems to be suddenly reacting to it. Uh, and that's why I said, I think that there could well have been a version of this in which this would come right after uh, verse 11, because I said God's question there actually did not demand an answer. We have other scriptural uh, precedence for seeing that as a statement in the form of a question. And then God would say, the man has become like one of us. But in any case, it indicates that the man is obviously now, this is a, a, a clear rupture where the man has acquired this uh, knowledge of his own capacity, as I said, for guilt and shame mm. uh, that God knew he had, but man found, found out a, a very uh, uh, unfortunate uh, way that this is the case. And so he's going to be barred from this tree of life. The tree of life will reappear in resurrection, in, in excuse me, resurrection, well, in a way, in revelation. At the end of Revelation, we find the tree of life growing in the kingdom of God. It's obviously a symbol there of God's provision for life. This, I think, is to remind us that, uh, that the man did not have a, a li life in himself, that he was dependent on God for his continuing life. And I think that's what the tree symbolizes, that, you know, unplugged from the source of life, 
uh, the man will go downhill spiritually, physically, in every other way. So verses 23 and 24, we have the exile that follows. Mm. Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay. So here is exile that the uh, Israelites were familiar with. And I think that this uh, reminds us that we're sort of in a Mesopotamian environment. I've said this before, that sort of filters up through the imagery here. When it says he drove the man out and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he, he, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword Mm. Uh, turning itself. We well, think, well, why couldn't have they just gone around to that? <laughs> okay, well, that's not the point uh, of this really. But why does it say that they were barred at the east? Well, uh, one fact is that if we look at the various stories of when devastation and distress were brought on Israel by invaders, uh, now, Israel was invaded from different directions, but when you look at where uh, the most devastating invasions happened, it was from enemies to the east. Uh, sometimes it was the Ishmaelites, or like in the Judges, you find the uh, account about uh, Gideon there. It was um, the Midianites, they lay to the east of Israel. The Babylonians and the Assyrians they lay east and northeast respectively of Israel and they were responsible for the greatest devastation that Israel ever suffered. Now, they usually invaded by coming down from the north because of skirting the Fertile Crescent, not crossing that large desert. So sometimes the, uh, the northern invasion, you know, you'll get that in some of the prophetic books, but there was always the knowledge that even if the attacker approached from the north, they were from the east. So the east was the, the place of the greatest threat. In fact, when we look in, in the book of Genesis, we see that uh, Abraham's nephew Lot is captured. That's from uh, you know uh, princes or sheikhs or kings from the east, from Mesopotamia. So in terms of staving off hostile forces, uh, sort of putting a, a, a guard at the east was something that Israel was familiar with. The, the tribes that were to the, on the east bank of the Jordan River were those that were uh, uh, like Reuben, for example, that uh, disappeared most quickly. Let me just say that, you know, Gad was another one um, because of their exposure to this uh, threat. Um, and so that's just, I think, a historical note that we have to uh, take into account. The other thing is the cherubim or cherubim. So we think of these as angels uh, properly, but we should note that nowhere in the scriptures are cherubs directly equated with angels. Now, they're given the characteristics of angels, so it's not in, you know, there's nothing wrong with thinking of them that way, but but we we probably should keep some distinction. The word angel means messenger. Uh, the cherubs were uh, angelic creatures. Um, but they were the best way to put this is spirit guardians, mm. uh, and this is not just true in Israel. This was across the ancient Near East that they were pictured this way. This is cherub-like creatures. That, that is, they were supernatural creatures. They were considered to be guardians placed by the gods uh, to guard important sites like the entrance to a temple, the entrance to a city. So if you look at uh, some of the ruins of the ancient Mesopotamian cities, you'll see these winged bulls, uh, the, uh, the uh, gate of, I forget, uh, the gate of Nimrud, uh, I think it is, is very famous. If you saw a picture of it, you might recognize it. It shows these cherub figures. They're also called genii, lamassu, uh, in the different languages of the ancient Near East. They have different words for them. 
but they all had this, they were powerful and they were guardians, the sphinxes. Okay, so like the great sphinx is actually, you know, you see him with the human head and the lion body, okay, a, a sphinx. Uh, if you uh, watch uh, documentaries about the sphinx, um, there's actually a temple complex adjoining that figure that it was guarding. You know, I mean, obviously in some kind of symbolic way because it's it's a statue, okay? But but they were there to picture the the uh, the sacredness and the fact that there were invisible spirit guardians there uh, that would presumably could cause bad things to happen to anyone who transgressed on the holy ground. So if we go just uh, before we close to Ezekiel, is probably the place where we have the most colorful description. So Ezekiel chapter one, and where Ezekiel in exile in Babylon as a prophet who's there to preach to the exiled community uh, from Judah who uh, who were living in exile at Babylon, and there's this vivid description of uh, the cherubs. They're called living creatures here. They're called cherubs over in chapter 10. It's a repeated, uh, a repeated reference to them. But if we look here, uh, let's just read verses 4 through 10. May, if you would read that. And then As I look, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually, and a bright light around it, and in its midst something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it there were figures resembling four living beings, and this was their appearance, they had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet were like calf, hoof, and they were gleam like varnished bronze. After their wings, on uh, their, under their wings, under their wings, on their four sides were human hands. As for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved; it went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, it had the face of a man. For all four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of a bull on the left. And all four had the face of, of an eagle. Okay, so strange creatures he sees coming with this uh, uh, coming with this storm wind. It turns out to be the presence of God coming on what's called a throne chariot here, and this has to do with the fact that Edom uh, that Eden was still a place in some sense of God's residence and His holy presence that they were not no longer welcome in, obviously. And that's why it required guarding. But we'll get in a little bit more about that next time. So uh, we'll close with prayer right now. Father, thank you for uh, what we're able to learn uh, from the scriptures that we can uh, grow in our Christ-like character and increase in our understanding. Guide us by your spirit until we're together again. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Mm. So give us your likes and comments. We'll continue with our discussion next time.